Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Today, I'm absolutely delighted, very thrilled about this episode uh, to introduce you to Edgewater Markets, a company I've just been finding out a little bit more about before we go on air here today. You've got two for the price of one. I'm excited to introduce you to Matt Castor and Brian Draco uh, over there in America. How are you guys? Doing well. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good indeed. Very good indeed. Listen, Loads to talk about. It's a great company doing some incredible things at the moment. Before we get into the meat of everything we're talking through, can you both uh, give us a bit of an introduction to yourselves? Brian, we'll start with yourself. Sure, perfect. I'm Brian Andreco. I looked after product and development for uh, Edgewater Markets. Fantastic. And Matt? Yep, my name is Matt Castle. I'm the COO of Edgewater Markets. I've been here for a little bit over 13 years, pretty much one of the founding members of the firm. And Edgewater is uh, an expert in liquidity and technology aggregation, and we're looking forward to being on this call. Fantastic. Well, listen, lovely to have you on it. And as you say, look, it's been a bit of a journey for you guys. It gave us a little bit of an elevator there into, into what you do, the markets you're, you're in. But tell us a little bit about how Edgewater are helping your customers and, and what you're doing at the moment. Matt, I'll let you kick that one off. Sure, sure. So Edgewater has been around since 2009. We were born out of the financial crisis um, uh, you know, over a decade ago. Um, we started with seven people here in the New York greater metropolitan area with a satellite office in London, and we've now grown to um, over 100 people globally with offices in New York, London, Singapore, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Santiago, Chile, and soon to be some other offices in uh, in Latin America and in Asia. So it, it's been a it's been a great growth story. Our main product, our flagship uh, kind of business, has been all about liquidity aggregation and technology services, which is a real important distinction because over the course of the past 13 years, they've kind of intersected one another. We're doing amazing things for our clients, both in uh, technology, liquidity aggregation, and credit intermediation. And, and, and it's kind of the three pillars of our product offering for our client base. And it's a genuinely global business. I mean, you, were, you, were, uh, you did very well to remember all the offices all, our, all around the world there. And it's pretty quick growth, isn't it? That I mean, we, we started a year behind you in this business. It goes by in the blink of an eye, doesn't it, when you're suddenly seeing it all uh, grow and develop. But that's pretty impressive growth all around it. How do you keep everyone connected like that? Well, I think that the help of technology, again, has always been a big, big kind of connector of people across oceans, across continents. And as most of us have seen in the post-COVID era, how interconnected people are just using their Zooms, their Teams, even this video in this interview is a sign of how technology can connect people. So I think the development of the technology, the development of people's willingness to use technology to be able to communicate and connect with one another has been super helpful in that process. We've already seen your heat-seeking camera that I was very impressed with at the start of all this. <laughs> but it's going to mean more to us than it is to the audience, but I'm very impressed with how technology can, uh, can keep everyone connected as we spoke about. We'll come back on to that in a second. Brian, you're in one of the, what I, what I think at the moment, I quite often say out on this show, is one of the coolest jobs in, in the world at the moment. Uh, and I'm seeing so much focus over recent years come into the whole product zone, which I think, uh, or the product job. I think maybe the last five to 10 years, we've seen it grow in significance. And I think it's so important that it has done because, you know, companies, I think, probably, um, you know, traditionally led by developers who are really, really, pushing their ideas onto people for a long time. I think the product manager and, and companies who, who are getting this absolutely right at the moment are looking at actually at the customer and saying, right, how do we take this idea? How do we take this technology and really make it fit for purpose? So from a product perspective, when you're listening to your customers at the moment, what are some of the things that Edgewater are able to really uh, highlight and, 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 and solve for them? Well, it's, a, it's almost exactly like what you just said. I mean, the, we built a flexible architecture. We had the benefit of building it kind of a second mover advantage. So we have the latest and greatest in terms of the, the technology. We've really been developing it aggressively over the last three to four years. It's mature. It, it runs everything that Edgewater Markets does on our own, on that global scale that Matt talked about. I mean, our data centers are in Singapore, Tokyo, London, New York, and Mexico City. We also connect to AWS. So it's got that global presence for that low latency distribution. 
But from a product development perspective, that's, again, one of the things that interests me as well. So I'm happy you said that. The goal of building this technology was really to empower uh, our clients to promote their brand, not our brand. So that technology design being flexible in that nature to accommodate that has really been a motivating and driving factor for what we do. And it's really helped us scale and uh, to that extent helped our clients scale as well. I think that's so important, isn't it? The, the, the shift in, in consensus there of actually listening to customers and having something bespoke to them sounds so obvious now, doesn't it? It sounds like an obvious play, play to make, but I still think so many of the companies that are are growing and, and look, it's impressive growth for you guys over a period where, where it hasn't necessarily, you know, born out of, you know, the credit crunch, gone through the pandemic, everything that, that's been there through and still with that sort of growth means that there's a success story to what you're doing. So I've said it on this show a lot. One of my big hobbies is, is, is uh, having spoken to hundreds of people on this show over the last couple of years is looking at golden threads about successful businesses. There's the natural sort of pieces such as leadership and team and product and, and various other bits and pieces. But the thing which I'm fascinated by is the ones who are, who are absolutely customer obsessed and looking at what that looks like to make them as successful as possible. So I think it's a really positive thing that you're looking at within there and really yeah. making sure that value proposition, as you say, is something which is fit for purpose that can really make them successful. Yeah, and we, we've seen we've seen a, a pretty sorry to interrupt there, but we've seen a very okay. large adoption in particular in the emerging markets. Really, that's been an area of focus. And and as a company, as you can gather from this conversation, we're a firm believer in those boots on the ground, like making sure we have that local market know how, and making sure that we're a conflict free partner. And that's really what we believe we are to these firms. We we become a partner. And to some extent, yes, it's it's having those clients tell us what they need and how what where their problems are and how we can bring the latest in technology from our world of, of FX and, and commodities and, and parlay it into their world, which is completely different. I mean, each one of these countries we go into has unique requirements. I'll take Latin America just as an example uh, off the uh, off the top. I mean, Brazil, FX is driven by the exchange. In Chile, it's driven by something called uh, data tech. In Colombia, it's driven by something called set effects. So every market's different. Their value dates are different. So the technology needs to be able to accommodate all of that and make sure that there are unique workflows that some of which go back to kind of homegrown infrastructure can be accommodated and, and leveraged so they can enter those global markets. I think the emerging markets is something there which a lot of people have been talking about recently. And I think your approach is really interesting in the boots and the ground piece, as you, as you mentioned before. Matt, at the start, you, you listed, I think, 17,000 different countries that you guys are uh, operate, <laughs> operating in, in, in at the moment. Tell us a little bit about how you've identified those emerging countries, which ones you're in at the moment, and actually then what it looks like to move, to move on from that. Where, where do you head next? Well, that's, that's a, it's a good question, and we're identifying that right now. Brian and I just got back from a trip in India and, and in Asia a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, as Brian said, our, our, our number one mission is to service our customers in a, in a conflict-free environment. And, and to do that, you really need to engage with the customers locally in each emerging market country. And, and through that kind of exchange and that, that, that real honest conversation, you can find out who, who can benefit from Edgewater Markets services. And, and, and from those conversations comes a list of, of clients, a list of clients in a region, a list of clients from a global perspective, and we can set our priorities of what countries we want to enter from that, well, from, from that information. But we, kind, we also kind of have a blueprint, right? And I can give you an example. I, I'll take Latin America since we started there, which we're very strong in. You know, a typical client for us looks like one of the bigger banks in the region, right, who's seen their market be infiltrated by the global institutions, right? Coming on shore and taking market share away, basically through their lack of electronification. And in the countries we tend to go into, it's really voice driven still. You have uh, either voice brokers or text uh, over Bloomberg chats, and there's only so much of that that can scale. A common problem we have, it, we hear over and over again, is like our clients will request a quote from us on a Bloomberg. By the time I got the FX rate and the spot rate, put it together and I'm able to quote back, it's already traded, right? Mm -hmm. So they're just missing out and they're, they're, they're seeing. So for us to go into some of these large onshore institutions and give them the technology they need to compete effectively onshore is great. 
But then again, to as Matt mentioned earlier, to leverage our, our credit services, our execution services, and our distribution to reach clients they normally wouldn't get is as far and away better than anyone else can really offer. It's really bringing those two services together to give them a complete solution. And it's technology that will that will facilitate all of that, whether it be you know, joining a, a counterparty that may be in Finland with a counterparty that may be in Chile and who have no direct relationship with each other. We know the counterparty in Finland. We know the counterparty in Chile, and we can connect them through, excuse me, our credit intermediation services. So it's a huge mm -hmm. component of it. You might have an onshore uh, partner in Peru and a client in Tokyo who have no relationship with one another, but the client in Tokyo is trading dollar Peru. And we connect and make that happen for them. And that's distribution points for the liquidity provider onshore in Peru. And it's liquidity for the offshore client in Tokyo who's trading dollar Peru. And the market just became more efficient by connecting them together. And they're connected by technology. Technology has always freed people from the shackles with whatever they're being shackled by and, uh, and credit and, and distribution and uh, connecting global players together in a way that they've never been connected is something we're real proud of. I think the world's definitely a smaller place because of technology, isn't it? And you, you guys have spoken about that sort of pride in, in, your, in your tech a, a, you know, a lot over the course of this conversation. It's obviously something there, which is a big part of what, you, what you're doing, which is probably testament to how the company's been able to you know, land and expand in so many different you know, regions. I think it's always interesting with tech, isn't it? That, that um, you know, we, we do a, an awards every single year about the best places to work within the sector. And quite often people talk about having you know, one of their USPs as a, as a workplace is the quality of technology. You know, they've all got greenfield tech and I know when people go out to marketplace, they're always talking about the power of their technology, et cetera, et cetera. Brian, give us a little insight into you know, what technology is that you guys have that makes it so special and it gives you the competitive advantage and more importantly, your clients the competitive advantage through that tech. Yeah, exactly right. Because it's it's all about them. Again, we use the tech ourselves, so we're we're actually a client of our of our own making, you know. But but the technology is modern, right? We it's a modern technology that people have kind of been waiting for to come out. You know, it's the back end is very low latency. We're as I said, it's dispersed. We leverage AWS for a uh, high availability and and proximity of our web services. So it encompasses all of that. But again, back to the client, as it always is with us, you'll hear that over and over again. It's really about the technology's ability of two things. One, to be innovative. So we have a team of developers. We have a development team in Mexico City, London, Singapore, and here in New York that powers this thing. We also, just uh, as an aside, have multilingual support in all of those regions as well. So, you know, the client, again, that boots on the ground and making sure everybody feels comfortable, that we understand the cultural nature of what they need this product for, the, the, the product's multilingual, all of that stuff is out of the box. But it's just making sure that, you know, hey, look, a lot of firms will come out there and say, here's the technology. Does it do A, B, C, and D? It does A, B, and C, but not D. And that's where you go. For us, we don't want the technology out of the box to be 100% engaged. Even We like it to be 80, 90, 95, which it always is. But we believe that that extra 20%, 15%, 10%, 5%, whatever it is, really sets them apart. I don't want my technology to be the same technology as the guy across the street from me. And that's what we bring to these clients. We go in, we listen to them, we make it unique. We incorporate their secret sauce. And that's that's the key element that's really driving the technical business that we have here. Yeah, the, 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 our flagship product is called EdgeFX Custom. And it's it's really does define the product, as Brian just explained. And we really custom build the product for the client, for their franchise needs. And I think it's a big differentiator from our competitors in the space. Definitely. I think that combined with the ability to be there on, you know, on the ground is another huge differentiator but between what I've seen people doing in that, that area as well. I want, I want to touch on that because, you, as you say, look, there's a lot of complexity to it, you know, international growth and having feet on the ground compared to just having international growth and doing it remotely. And, and you know, that's a lot, a lot about identification of markets. I know you guys are back from, as you say, Singapore and Mumbai recently. You've obviously investing a lot of time, effort, and thought into where you go next and and what's the right place to you know, to put the uh, spade in the ground, so to speak. With when you're doing that, 
talk to me about that selection process again, but then also talk to me about the actual growth aspect of, of how you put that team in place to, to give you the confidence that it's a team there that will represent you as much as it is in the original homes of, uh, of London and New York. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the, the success that we've had in Latin America, particularly with the uh, non-deliverable forward countries, has been tremendous. So our, our natural inclination, inclination is to move to the next country in the world that has a real appetite for uh, non-deliverable forwards. It could be India, it could be Korea, it could be Taiwan, it could be Indonesia, anywhere out in the main Asia NDF countries. And that's what we're looking at right now. We're already in Chile, we're already in Peru, we're already in Colombia, we're already in Brazil, and now we're moving moving further eastward. I, I think that the decision-making tree that, that points us to the countries that we're going to be in next is going to be based on appetite, appetite need of technology services. There are, as Brian said, there are, are, there are so many banks, big banks that are, are dealing with 15, 20, 25-year-old legacy technology that they don't even know what the newest technology looks like. And so mm. us going there and showing them what options they have by partnering with Edgewater, it really opens their eyes to the possibilities of unleashing their franchise potential. And it's through those conversations, it's through those trips that we kind of identify that, you know, we want to be in India, we want to be in Korea, we want to be in Indonesia, we want to be in the Philippines, we want to be in Taiwan. And, and, and that's kind of going to be our, our year, year and a half goal going forward. So that's all on the uh, on the radar for you, is it? All, all on the radar. Yeah, and we've also seen, again, it's the same principles, but we've seen significant uptick in the Middle East and the GCC pairs. Uh, we've applied this theory to metals as well. So going downstream from just the financial institutions and, and bringing on uh, more of the users and, and giving them the, the refiners, the refiners and things like that to get them technology enabled to enter these global markets. So any of these pockets of liquidity that have that demographic uh, really, really uh, is easily able to adopt the technology, make it their own, and then enter the global space. So we, which, which goes back to the value proposition that we were speaking about earlier, and, and it's providing our clients real value to their franchise. And, and, and just to give you an example of that, we've gone to several countries in the world where their technology is, is, is 10, 15, 25 years old. It's just legacy technology that, that they don't even know what is available to them. And when we show them what type of product Edgewater can deliver to their franchise, they really start to see the potential of unleashing the potential of their franchise, which has not reached its potential yet because they haven't updated their technology. And just to give you an example of that, uh, we had a client in Latin America that was providing uh, onshore NDF rates to the offshore market. And what that does is it creates uh, some forward exposure for them. And, and while this had been going on for the past two or three years, it wasn't until the, the, the extreme rise in interest rates in the past 12 months that created an entirely different amount of risk for that bank in terms of managing their forward exposure. And while they had not, they had no experience managing that forward exposure in the past because they had provided the onshore, offshore uh, liquidity, but with the rise in the interest rates, it gave them another tool within the bank to be able to manage their, their, their risk from other departments. And they found that it was that risk and that exposure that provided them the most value. And it's really a unique byproduct of what we were trying to do and what they were trying to do. But as you get into this whole technology windstorm of what it can unleash for, for, for a franchise, there are things that come knocking on the door that you never really thought of before. It is distribution, it's product, it's execution, uh, it, it's real value of firm liquidity. And as I said, when you go back to these conferences, they were talking about best execution. They were talking about last look. They were talking about all these modes of which clients interact with the market and the type of technology that we're providing to our clients who are then providing services to the general market is all about best execution. It's all about the absence of market impact and it's all about firm liquidity. So when you go to trade gold and you wanna trade from a spot price from a bank, well, that's great. I mean, it's risk transference, 
But what about if you want to go trade with a refiner who actually has inventory and that there's no market impact from that and there's nobody taking the other side of your trade where there might be a conflict of interest? So there, there's there's lots of different variables of, of, of how the technology can serve to bring people together. It can be a refiner with a hedge fund. It can be a local onshore pension fund in Latin America with a hedge fund in London. The possibilities are limitless. I think there's a lot of interesting things you just uh, pulled, pulled out of that, which which kept me thinking again about why people are investing at the moment in technology full stop. So you're right. It's constantly amazing, isn't it? How backwards some of the thinking is te- you know, technically or, or how blind people are to some of the opportunities that, that are there with wow technology has advanced in recent years. You don't know what you're missing out until you've got it, until you can see it and push it out in front of people. So I think there's some amazing stuff that comes into there. But I look also at the drivers and say, right, why are people investing in technology at the moment? And generally that will be about speed. So is it giving them a competitive advantage? Is it about friction reduction and making the process easier? Is it about optimization and and basically reducing costs and and making them more efficient? And it sounds to me that that all of those are right in the sweet spot of where you guys are are, are positioning your offering, right? Yeah, yeah, that and scale, which is which is the big piece, right? Because you're you're taking a predominantly voice-driven market, like you talk about a refiner, you talk about a a local bank, voice everything, chat everything. The scale is what the technology brings as well, which combines all those elements you just mentioned. And if you think about it from a perspective of just retail, if you think back, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago when there was a mom and pop hardware store and it reached the local community, and then you move to a a larger store like Home Depot or Walmart, and now it's reaching a a significantly larger group of communities. And then you move to an enterprise like Amazon, which now reaches everybody globally through technology. That's the scalability that that technology offers. And to translate it into the financial markets, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you would have a trader sitting at a bank speaking to 10 or 15 different customers on a Bloomberg chat or some other chat mechanism. And that's the maximum amount of clients that he can interact with in a day. But if you put that and you electronify it, that 10 turns into 10,000. And now your franchise really has the opportunity to scale. And that is what technology does. And that's the real power of it. And that's the conversations we're having in these markets, exactly what you just said. So it's so transformative for them. They must be welcoming you with open arms. When, when, when you're there and you're, you're you know, let's, let's say Peru or you know, you're landing in a new territory, talk to us about the operations that you, you're, you're dropping there. So you've got boots on the ground. What does that look like? Is it, is it physical offices? Is, is it individuals? Are you growing teams? What's, what's it look like? Is it dependent on the client base and what they need or what they want or the size and scale of the opportunities or the clients you're winning? What do those satellite offices look like for you? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's it's generally comprises a couple of different things. There's there's somebody from the sales or account management perspective there that will be able to carry on the relationship, have business discussions, let's say, understand the market know-how. They're they're typically ex somebody from the business in those marketplaces that are part of our team now and and helping us to understand the requirements and and communicate that back and forth to nail the requirements down to make sure that we address everything that the bank's looking for. And then it's it's always uh, some sort of technologist and support staff as well. Again, the, the local language, the culture, all the timing, the hours, all of it just works for us. And that works for the clients, which is the piece that's important. It's incredible to see that it's, it's such an international business is, is where you're at. I want to look at the market as a whole. I'm fascinated at the moment about the, the sort of macroeconomic situation that we're, we're living in. There's so many different things happening all across the world in so many different areas. But let's look at your your particular niche. Let's look at the FX world. Matt, I know this is your baby. You're looking at this a little bit, a, a, you know, quite a lot at the moment. Talk to us about some of the trends that we're seeing on a, on a, on a wider basis that's affecting your, your client base. Get your crystal ball out and give us a couple of predictions about what's going to happen across the rest of the year. All right. Well, I think 2022, you know, once the Fed embarked on their hiking cycle and and the rest of the world followed suit from June of 2022, all the way to call it January of 2023, was fairly predictable. It was going to be an aggressive hiking cycle to tame inflation, not just here in the U.S., but globally. I think one of the things that the U.S. did for a good year or two there 
just after the COVID crisis ended was that we exported an enormous amount of inflation to the world. And as the dollar got stronger, it made things more expensive for the rest of the world that was all priced in dollars. And I think what we're seeing now is really the early days of a shift of that. Um, we're getting towards the end of the hiking cycle. And whether that happens in, in a month from now or in three months from now, we are further along in, in that cycle than we were a year ago. And so you're starting to see that the dollar gets sold a little bit. And the anticipation is that it's going to export some deflation, which is a really important component as parts of Europe have suffered more from the inflation than the U.S. has. So, you know, people forget where the dollar was a year or two ago and, and, and where we are now. The dollar is still extremely strong across the board and there's more dollar deflation to export in their balance of 2023. I think once we get past or in, into the end of the Q4 of 2023, I think there's going to be some enormous investment opportunities. I think the, the world will be coming out of or will be looking towards the, the end of a tunnel of a potentially rough recession period in the second half of, of 2023. And usually right. towards the tail end of these events, you start to see the investment come back and people preparing for the next business cycle. Uh, unfortunately, in 2024, in the U.S. at least, we're going to be going through a, a pretty, what I anticipate to be a pretty rough election cycle. So you, the investment may take place from, you know, kind of all of 2024 for it to be truly realized in 2025. Yeah, it's a really interesting play, isn't it? Because, because yeah, the, you, you kind of almost forget that, that uh, with all the volatility we've seen, there's going to be something there that could be quite extraordinary next year over in, in the States. Which will, which will naturally have its sort of uh, knock-on effects. I think that VC piece is really interesting. There's a lot of you know dry powder again that's, that sort of gets accrued over this sort of stage. But, you know, when when we go back to the start of 22, end of 21, it was unprecedented amount you know the amount of stuff that was happening at that sort of time. And I agree with you. There's a very exciting sort of play coming up over the next uh, six to 12, 12 months. A friend of mine always says I'm wrong for calling it a barometer, but the recruitment industry, I think, is, is always an interesting barometer for uh, where the market heads uh, and when people are starting to gain the confidence in hiring. And uh, you know, with everything that was going on, I think December through to the first you know, first quarter of this year, last quarter of last year, first quarter of this year, everyone was a little bit uh, waiting to see what happened. We've seen a real increase out of uh, of Q2. And I think that's a, that's an exciting uh, place to, to be in. I'm going to, I'm going to um, start to, to move us to a close here, Brian, by pointing at you and talking about who should be reaching out to you guys at the moment. There's a lot of uh, you know, ground we've covered today. And I feel like, as I said to you before, just before we came on air, this is going to go in the blink of an eye, which it has. <laughs> um, <laughs> but tell me, tell me a little bit about who should be reaching out to you. What sort of companies are you able to help at the moment? What sort of geography should they be thinking right, if, if, uh, if we're sat here? Always quite bizarrely to me, this, this, this show is listened to in all corners of the world. So uh, you can be speaking to anyone in any part of the world. The beauty of technology which we've spoken to beforehand. Who can be reaching out to you and who can you help? Well, it's really a broad cross-section. I mean, obviously, we've been talking about the people with a local market know-how who needs technical help. That's, that's somebody that's always in our sweet spot for sure. But we help some of the largest hedge funds, right? Even though they're technology literate, making sure that they have the correct liquidity integrated, the a screen customized the way they want it to look. We talk to the largest banks in the world. We talk to corporates. You know, So it's really anybody who can use those execution services that we offer, which is our bread and butter, coupled with a unique technical experience. I mean, those are the two things when we bridge those two pieces together, that tends to be our client base. I think we're, we're up to what, 380 plus of the largest financial institutions in the world, leveraging us in one capacity or another. So it's it's a, it's a fairly large cross-section and, and, and we're happy to help and partner with all of our clients and look forward to making new relationships. Not about 13, 14 years of it, is it? So uh, Brian, tell, who should they be reaching out to? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? I think the best way is to head to our website, edgewatermarkets.com. And there, they'll be able to find each regional office and contact information through emails, through phone numbers, or, you know, just filling out a little bit of information on the website itself and, and submitting it. I, I think that we're all pretty easy to find. You can find us on, on Bloomberg. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us, again, on our website. And 
Um, you know, I, I, the only thing I encourage all clients and, and all prospective interest in parties to think about is to open your mind up to not what we have, but what you need. And then we will build what you need. Sounds fantastic. I'm going to leave on a high and ask us about Edgewater Markets 23, 24. Titalize us. Tell us what the most exciting stuff that's coming up. What can we what can we really get excited about about what you you guys are planning for the year ahead? Well, you know, I think that I think there's been a couple of events over the last few years that have really stood out to me. It could have been the Brexit, you know, uh, many years ago, ten years ago or so. I think when Trump was elected was a a pretty interesting time. I think that obviously COVID was extremely transformative for the market and then and just last year the Ukraine election and the and the and the and the drastic hiking interest rate cycle each one of them created an enormous absence of liquidity and and the markets really were scurrying around for okay well everybody can provide liquidity when there's when there's really nothing going on but who's really there when when it's all going on and we're finding ways to fill those those pockets of liquidity with combining the real inventory of the market, whether it be the refiners in in Switzerland providing metals liquidity, or it's the onshore inventory holders in Latin America or in Asia that can provide the, the true onshore, offshore NDF liquidity. That's really where our focus is. I don't expect the world to stay as calm as it's been in the last a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and, and certainly to start 2023. And we're making preparations to be able to help all of our clients deal with any kind of gaps in liquidity for the next event that takes place in the world, which is, you know, I guess, imminent. Almost certainly with, uh, with the last, last few months of anything to go by. Uh, Matt Bryant, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. I've, I've loved finding out a little bit more about the business. I find it fascinating about how, you, how you're doing it. I love the fact that tech is, is so innovative and in driving everything in there. Uh, you must come into our next magazine. We're talking about an appetite for disruption in the marketplace and how companies like yours are doing some incredible things. So, yeah, I'd love to have you in the next uh, ep- uh, issue of uh, the financial technology. It's been really good to see you writing about that as well. So, listen, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank today. you, Toby. Thank Thank you you. as well. Great talking to you. Likewise. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.